We've heard a lot in the news lately about being summoned. Maybe not that language, but indictments, subpoenas, both forms of summons are mentioned by reporters and pundits these days more than I care to count. We don't use the word summon much anymore unless we are referring to legal proceedings. But something about that phrase, you've been summoned, kept popping up into my head as I was reading these texts today. Summoned feels like a stronger word to me than called, more heft to it, likely because of the legal connotations. When we are summoned to court, for whatever reason, we go. We may try to find some way around it, but legally, we have to show up. It's not optional. These stories from our scriptures today describe what seemed to me to be a summons. In these texts, for both Moses and Jesus, a summons is involved with an implied expectation of obedience that doesn't really seem optional. Now, it's not a coercive obedience, though. It's a liberating one. The evidence is clear here and in so many other of our texts in Scripture that an encounter with the divine changes things. It reshapes us. It upends our priorities. It liberates us. And that very liberation makes demands upon us. It seems that it is only in our obedience to God's way that we are truly free. And if that seems paradoxical, you're right. It absolutely is. In the Exodus reading, we meet Moses, who is a fugitive. He has fled Egypt after murdering an Egyptian for beating a Hebrew slave. Moses ends up in the land of Midian. He marries Zipporah, the daughter of the priest Jethro, and he becomes a shepherd. As our reading begins, it's just an ordinary day for Moses. He's led his flock beyond the wilderness to Horeb, the mountain of God. The Hebrew meaning for Horeb is wasteland. He's out in a desolate dried up spot. I don't know if they have tumbleweed in that part of the world, but in my mind's eye, that's what I see. I see tumbleweed rolling by over a dusty landscape with Moses sitting on a rock, maybe playing the Middle Eastern version of a harmonica. A sheep wander around looking for scrub to eat. Moses is doing what he does every day. Nothing to see here. But then there is something to see. He notices a bush that's on fire. Perhaps that's not in and of itself that strange of a sight. It's hot. It's dry there. There were probably fires from time to time. This bush in Hebrew, or a bush in Hebrew, is called Sina and is verbally linked to Sinai, which is what this mountain will be called later when Moses ascends it to receive God's commandments. But for now, Moses does a double take when he realizes that this bush is burning, but it is not disintegrating. It's not becoming ash. Moses says to himself or to the sheep or to the tumbleweed, I must turn aside and look at this and see why this bush isn't burned up. I must turn aside and look. And it's only when God sees that Moses has turned toward the bush for closer inspection, that God speaks. The rabbis say this is a moment of divine condescension. God comes low. God makes God's self lowly, entering into the natural world, which now becomes God's instrument for a genuine encounter with Moses. First, before the encounter can occur, Moses must turn aside and look. He has to notice. He has to be paying attention. Curiosity leads to the call. 
God calls to Moses out of that bush, and Moses is afraid, afraid to look at God. This is not some disembodied voice, but some sort of an appearance of the divine. God could be seen and heard. Initially, Moses is hiding his face for fear he will die if he looks upon God's presence, but eventually begins to engage in a conversation. Now, we know what led Moses to this moment. We know his history, that he's on the lamb from the law. There's nothing particularly special about this day. His sheep just needed a place to graze, and so out he went. But what about God? What has led God? to this encounter with Moses. And we know that too. God's people are suffering. God's people are suffering. I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know, God says, I know their suffering. And I've come down to deliver them and bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. God's motivation for this divine encounter is the pain of God's people. God's heart is breaking. And God must act, not just to deliver the people from oppression, but into new possibilities for now and into the future. But there is a catch. God says, so come, Moses. I will send you to bring my people out of Egypt. All of this sounded great to Moses until this moment. He has officially been summoned. So much for an ordinary day. And just as God works through that bush, to get Moses' attention, God will now work through Moses to get Pharaoh's attention and to accomplish God's people's deliverance. But as we might expect, Moses is not convinced, and between his nerves and probably trying to buy some time so he can come up with an exit strategy, he begins to pepper God with questions, and they start going back and forth. Moses But who am I to do this? God, I will be with you. Moses, but if I do this, who do I say has sent me? God, the God of your ancestors. Moses, but what if they ask your name? God, tell them I am who I am. I am has sent me to you. So let's recap. Moses is a fugitive from justice in Egypt, who we're later told just in a couple of verses that he's slow of speech and slow of tongue, which perhaps means he has a stutter or some other speech issue. Despite Moses' lack of eloquence and his fugitive status, he is summoned by the God of all creation from a bush that doesn't burn in the middle of a wasteland to go back to the very place where he is a wanted man and speak on God's behalf to the Pharaoh the head of the Egyptian empire, who, by the way, is not a very nice person, and who has enslaved God's people for decades, and Moses is to convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. That's God's plan. God is funny. (laughs) Poor Moses. He likely wants to run or play dead to get out of it, but he doesn't. He's been summoned by the living God, a God who is not removed from us, but who bends low to engage with us, to hear our cries, to deliver us from our pain. And when we encounter this God, I am, Yahweh, we tremble, we protest, perhaps we hide our face. But in the end, we only find true freedom by heeding that summons. Jesus knows about heeding a summons. His will cost him his life. 
think we sometimes maybe want to make it easier on ourselves, what happened to Jesus, to say, well, you know, he was born to die for our sins. Somehow making his brutal execution at a young age easier to take. But given that Jesus was a human being, flesh and bone, just like us, with free will, with agency, I believe in theory he could have walked away. Just as, in theory, Moses could have walked away. In our gospel, when Peter says to Jesus, God forbid that you will suffer at the hands of the establishment. Uh Uh-uh. That you'll be killed? No. You're the Messiah. I just told you you're the Messiah. Jesus' sharp response to Peter likely comes from the deep conflict going on inside of him his own temptation to agree with Peter. Get behind me, Satan, tempter. Don't cause me to stumble, to question what I have been called to do. But if you think about it, Jesus isn't summoned by God to die. Jesus is summoned by God to live. To truly live. Which means living God's way in the world. A way of mercy, a way of freedom, of compassion, of inclusion, of radical hospitality. To see every single person as God does to turn upside down the world so that we can finally live right side up in it. That is the summons to which Jesus responds, a summons not to die, a summons to live. But we know in our beautiful but broken world, such a summons too often may lead to physical death. Because we in the world have a way, don't we? We have a way of choosing the ways of death over and over and over. Clinging to our fear, our power, our position, our own comfort, self-preservation, violence. Rejecting the true life God has calling each of us to the true life God gave to us in Jesus. Jesus tells us plainly, if you want to follow me, my way, my truth, my life, it's not going to be comfortable. Deny yourself. Take up your own cross. For those who want to stay safe, and never risk on behalf of another. Those who cling to the way things are, even as people are mistreated and abused, they will lose the true and authentic life God longs for all of us to have. But those who live into my way of being in the world, who are ready to let go of their comfort, their safety, Yes, maybe even their physical life. Those who trust even as they tremble. Who take steps, big or small, on behalf of the suffering. Who lead with love every single time. No matter what the cost. They will truly live. Ain't no grave going to hold them down. My dear friend, Charlie Strobel, died on August 6th at 80 years old. I've known Charlie for 25 plus years. Many of you may know Charlie or know of Charlie, who founded Room in the Inn, which serves those living on the streets to not only provide shelter, as Charlie would say, but to provide community, and belonging for everyone. Charlie and his three siblings were raised in Nashville 
by his mother and his great aunts after his dad died when Charlie was only four years old. In 1970, he became a priest, and in 1977, he began serving at Holy Name Catholic Church in East Nashville. That was a location at that time where many of the city's unhoused would hang out and gather, and it still is. Charlie started making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to give to people hanging around the church because they didn't have anything to eat. He said some days it felt like that's all Charlie did all day long was make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. In 1985, on a very cold winter night, Charlie saw some guys huddled out in the parking lot, shivering, and he invited them in the church. Come on in, guys. Come on in. You can sleep in here. Reflecting on this decision, Charlie would say, once I did it, I knew I could never go back. He kept inviting them in, and Room in the Inn was born. Today, 200 congregations representing a variety of faith traditions partner with Room in the Inn to shelter people from November through March and hopefully create the beloved community, community if even for a, a night. And this model has spread across the country. Many have called Charlie a saint. He did not like that. He would quote, Catholic worker, movement founder, and champion of the poor, Dorothy Day, who said, please don't make me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. In other words, if we can make folks like Charlie a saint, there's an implication he did something the rest of us can't do. Charlie would say, I just did what God wants every single one of us to do. Love people. See the good in everyone. Treat them like your family, because they are. Give them food when they're hungry, and invite them in when it's cold. That's all. Charlie's burning bush was a cold night, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and God showing up in a group of shivering street people with no place to go. After that night, Charlie's life was never the same, and neither were the lives of countless people, including my own. God summons each of us every day in big ways and in many small ways. Like Moses, like Charlie, we must be curious and attentive listening and looking for God to appear all around us for that encounter that will change us and summon us to people and places we could never have imagined and may never have wanted to go. But the promise to us is the same as it was to them. God says, I will be with you. I will be with you. And because of this promise, God's summons is one we cannot ignore. For it leads us and it leads our world to true life and brand new possibilities. So as we gather today at the table together, may we encounter the risen Christ, God's presence here in plain, simple elements, blessed, broken, shared. May we be nourished with the faith that we need to be God's people, for God to work in us and through us in ways we could never have imagined. Thanks be to God.